Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, and if you yourself are new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby, and welcome. Today's case revolves around the gruesome murder of Brian Shabbert, a person whose case is considered solved, but no arrests have ever been made, or ever will. The story of a robbery gone wrong. But before we get into that case, I have to say that today's video is sponsored. Magellan TV is a video streaming service that is dedicated to bringing its viewers the highest quality documentaries. If you are interested in expanding your knowledge about topics you're passionate about, Magellan TV is for you. Right now, Magellan TV has over 2,000 documentaries acquired by some of the best filmmakers and documentary networks from all around the world. No matter what interests you, you will find documentaries on there that you will enjoy. The genres include biography, space, science and tech, mind and body, earth, nature, ancient history, early modern, current history, war and military, historical drama, culture, and crime and mystery. Which obviously, if you know anything about me, the crime and mystery section is the one that I went to first. They also add new programs every single week so you'll never run out of things to watch. Magellan TV can be watched anytime and anywhere and is compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, iOS, and there are no ads, so you can enjoy your programs with no interruptions. Their crime and mystery section is absolutely incredible, including documentaries and docuseries about tons of cases from all around the world that even I had never heard of before. Magellan TV is a company that I've worked with before. I absolutely love their service, especially with everything going on in the world. I have a lot more free time, so I've been watching it pretty religiously lately. And the documentary that I most recently watched is called Killer in the Family. It's a documentary that is about 45 minutes long. It's not too long. It takes place in Ireland. Now, most of the cases that I cover on my channel are here in America, so it's always interesting to dive into cases that take place elsewhere in the world. When I first read the title, I thought it just had to do with interviews from people whose family members had committed murder, but it's a lot deeper than that. It has to do with murder suicides, which of course is a very touchy subject, and it was just a complete emotional roller coaster. There's basically no narration with it, it's just interviews with family members, so it's very raw. If you do check out Magellan TV, definitely check out that documentary, I highly recommend it. If you yourself want to try out Magellan TV, you can get one month free by clicking the link in the description of this video or going to try.magellantv.com slash gabulosis. So thank you Magellan TV for sponsoring another one of my videos and let's just get right into the case. This is the case of Brian Lee Shepard. Brian Lee Shepard was born to parents Arnold and Laura Shepard at St. Luke's Hospital in Cedar Rapids, Iowa on March 2nd of the year 1967. He was the first of what would be two children. His parents would later have his younger brother, Darren. His mother described him as very quiet and shy, but very smart. He attended Garfield Elementary School, Franklin Junior High School, and Washington High School. After he graduated from high school, he decided to do what a lot of people decide to do. He was going to take a year off from school. He was going to work basically that whole year, save up money, and then go to college. During this one year that he took off from school, he worked at a convenience store called The Come and Go. From my research, Brian had a great work ethic. He was definitely not the type of person to just sit around and do nothing. He had to keep busy, he wanted to keep working, he had goals in life. That's the type of person that Brian was. After that year of full-time working at the convenience store, he decided to enroll at Coe College, a college nearby in Cedar Rapids. While going to college, he decided to continue his job at the Come and Go to further help pay for his education. Like I said before, Brian was described as being very smart. He was double majoring in political science and history. 
This was Brian's life for a few years, and when it came to working at the convenience store, he liked to work late at night into the early morning, and he liked working these hours because it was less busy, there was less traffic, and he had a lot of free time while working, so he would use this free time to study. Of course, his parents being loving, caring, protective parents, it doesn't matter if their child was five years old or 30 years old. They were still going to worry about their kid, and they did worry about Brian working these late night hours. He primarily focused on finishing school. That was his main goal. He did also have another goal in life, and that was to marry a girl named Connie after he graduated college. They had met and became friends when he was in college. They never really made it official and gave each other the boyfriend-girlfriend label, but apparently they said that after college, they were going to tie the knot. But he would never even get the chance to officially propose to her. This is a photo I came across on the family's website of Connie and Brian. It was taken at Adventureland in August of 1989 only a month before the night that this tragic story takes place. The beginning of September of the year 1989 was when the first week of college began at Coe College, and at this time, Brian was 22 years old and he was ecstatic to be starting his final year of school. September 8th of 1989 was just like any other early morning for Brian, nothing out of the ordinary. He was working the midnight shift at the Come and Go, the little gas station he'd spent most nights at, the one sitting at 2743 Mount Vernon Road Southeast. According to a Cedar Rapids article, around 3.15 a.m., a cab driver named Thomas Cress stopped by the Come and Go to buy some gas. Upon entering the store, he could see that something was very wrong. With each step, he was closer to discovering something he would never be able to erase from his mind. He found the body of Brian Shepard lying on the floor of the convenience store. The police were phoned immediately and after examining Brian's body, he had multiple stab wounds in his back and his throat was slit. The 22 year old was slain during a robbery. We know it was a robbery because Brian's body was found laying in front of the safe the safe was open and it was empty. It is unknown if the robber or the robbers had the intention of killing the person that was working that night, but of course, they obviously brought a knife or knives. We don't know if they brought it just to scare the person and then something happened, there was some sort of a struggle and they ended up killing the person. This is information we don't know. I always like to look up the weather outside when it comes to robberies, mostly because a lot of people who decide to rob will, nine out of 10 times, wait for it to be a rainy, thundery night, a night that people nearby might not hear a gunshot or a scream. According to Weather Underground, the temperature in Cedar Rapids on September 8th, 1989, was around 70 degrees, and it was foggy, rainy and there were thunderstorms in the area. The perfect weather for not many people to be out in, whether it's after midnight or not. And the perfect weather where you might not be able to hear someone screaming nearby. I also have to mention that September 7th going into September 8th was a Thursday going into a Friday. So this was not as busy as say the 8th going into the 9th, which was a Friday going into a Saturday. Most gas stations are usually very out of the way, along a highway, or they're by stores that would be closed at the hour that Brian was brutally killed at. But if you look at this photo here, you can see there behind the gas station what looks like an apartment building, I'm guessing, and across the street is what looks like a house. I'm not entirely sure if anyone would have 100% been able to hear a scream or commotion next door, but I wouldn't say it would be impossible. The news of Brian's murder spread very quickly through the Cedar Rapids area, so fast that by the end of the day, a witness came to police and said that they had seen a strange man in the area not long before Brian's body was found. The sketch was done and released to the public that same day. The man was described as being a white male in his 20s. I'm not sure, early 20s or late 20s. He was said to have shoulder length brown hair and about 170 pounds, standing at roughly six feet tall. A witness also placed a van near the store around the time of the murder. 
Police checked out more than 400 vans in the area of Cedar Rapids that looked like the one described by the witness, and nothing much came of it. Police later admitted that possibly the van was there because it was a delivery driver simply making a delivery to the convenience store. When it came to my research on this case, I couldn't personally find out if a delivery driver had made a stop at the convenience store that night or not. I don't think that this would have been too difficult of information for police to find out, but I just don't think it was released to the public. Deliveries are usually on a set schedule, so to find this information out, police would basically just have to call the owner of the convenience store, but I just couldn't find this information anywhere online. But if a delivery driver had made a stop at the convenience store, that would obviously explain a van being there that night. Either way, the sketch and the word of this strange van being in the area around Brian's murder basically went nowhere and this case ran cold. Brian Shepard was eventually laid to rest in Cedar Memorial Park Cemetery, but this case is far from over. Considering the safe in the store was found left open means obviously Brian opened it himself or gave them the combination. If they got what they intended to get, which is the money, why did they kill him? I personally feel like the robber or robbers got the money and killed him because they didn't want him to be able to describe them in any way to police. If it was one of those situations where, say, Brian wanted to be the hero and not give forward the money that the store had and wanted to protect the store, I don't think he would have opened the safe to begin with. I really just think it's a situation where they got what they said that they wanted and they probably told Brian that he was going to live and that they just wanted the money and then they simply just killed him anyway. It would kind of be a different situation if, say, Brian was on the floor next to the safe and the safe was closed and they never got into it and then they killed him, but they got into the safe. So you got what you wanted. What was your point in killing this innocent man? Three decades later, in September of 2019, Brian's father, Arnold, told the Gazette, I would drive by in the mornings and look over to see if I could see him working. And that morning, I looked over and I knew that something was very, very wrong. Police were in the parking lot and the area had been cordoned off with yellow crime scene tape. Arnold said he thought about stopping to see what happened, but police were everywhere and he figured they would stop him. So he went on to work, thinking he'd call his son when he got there. He continued, When I called, an officer answered the phone, and at first he'd only tell me that we should go to Mercy Hospital, but I kept prodding him, and he eventually told me that something had happened to Brian. Brian's mother, Laura, said, We didn't know how serious it really was until we got to the hospital. Laura Shepard, who is now 81, says, They told us there was nothing they could do. He was gone. I cried all day. The tears wouldn't stop. It was very hard. It still is. Arnold said, I've kind of put the hate part behind, but someday before I die, I hope I know who did it, and I see him in the witness box trying to argue his way out of it. There might still be a little bitterness there. I don't know. There was one thing that police and friends and family of Brian were thinking, and that was, did the robber or the robbers choose this convenience store at random, or did they know Brian personally? Did they know that Brian was going to have the combination to the safe? Well, when it comes to his father, Arnold, he believed that the people responsible or the person responsible did know Brian personally. The ironic thing in this case is that only two weeks before his murder, Brian was promoted to assistant manager. And at Brian's job, assistant managers are given something and that something is the combination to the safe. Now when you think about it, what are the chances that he works there for years and is the person there when the store is robbed only two weeks after being given the combination to the safe? The thing the robber or robbers come there for. They want the combination. They need the person there working there to have the combination to the safe. And they robbed the come and go the night that Brian, one of the only people had this combination to the safe. And 
Brian's body was literally found lying next to the safe, meaning they killed him right after getting into it. I've talked about robberies gone wrong on my channel before and there's always one comment that comes up in the comments down below of the video and that is, were there any security cameras? Well, when it comes to Brian's case, no, but his case is the one that helped change that. Following the death of Brian Shepard, Marion city leaders came to the conclusion that more stores needed surveillance cameras. This was decided in the year he was murdered, which was 1989. And by the mid 1990s, pretty much every store had at least one camera. This change definitely helped in the years to come. Even as soon as January of 1992, when a store called the Coastal Mart in Marion was robbed and within no time, the robber's image was on every television screen in the area during the five o'clock news. Also, Brian's case would not be the last case of a robbery at this specific convenience store in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. On November 15th of the year 1996, which was seven years later, Christopher J. Kibler and Jerome M. Robertson and a 17-year-old girl whose name I couldn't find anywhere online were all arrested for robbing the come and go the day before on the 14th. The article from the Gazette read, officers were a few blocks from the store when the clerk called at 3.59 a.m. to report she'd been held up by two men wearing ski masks and armed with a sawed off shotgun. An officer noticed someone slumping down as if to hide in a car parked in the 2900 block of Seeley Avenue Southeast, and all three occupants were arrested. The shotgun, ski masks, and cash taken from the store were found in the car, according to the complaint against Robertson. The suspect's shoes matched footprints at the store. Kibler and Robertson also were identified through videotape from the store's surveillance camera. Kibler and Robertson were later convicted of first-degree robbery and the possession of an offensive weapon, and they were sentenced to 30 years in prison, and they had to serve up to 85% of their sentence. There wasn't only one robbery at the come and go since Brian's case. It was actually the third in less than a year. The one before that was on June 3rd of the same year and was done by a 17-year-old named Damien Medulin. The one before that was on November 26th of the year 1995 and was done by a 35-year-old named Danny Hodges. By the late 90s, there were security cameras everywhere, basically outside of every store, but robberies were still going on. So much so that Cedar Rapids police started putting on seminars for how to handle a robbery properly. Most of the people that attended these seminars were business people or employees who often worked alone or at night. They would kind of just teach you how to go about being in a situation like that, like how to stay calm and remember that money is just money and put your safety above all else. Also, if someone has something that looks like a gun, even if it's fake, just assume it's real because you never know. Through the years, just like any case, there were tons of different leads. There were different sketches done of people said to be in the area at the time of Brian's murder that were unknown to locals at the time. People didn't know who these people were. There were also sketches done of vans or automobiles seen around the convenience store. But basically none of this went anywhere. Dozens and dozens and dozens of people came forward with information that they thought could help further this investigation, that could help eventually solve it. But this case was as ice cold as ever. But as the title of this video states, this case is solved. And it was actually solved last year in 2019. Just last year, police announced to the public that Brian Shepard's case is closed. They know who did it, but there's no arrests made, and there never will be. And the reason for that is pretty simple. The people responsible are deceased. When it comes to the people that police believe were responsible for Brian's death, it was two individuals. Their names have not been released to the public, and I'm pretty positive they never will be. But police said that both men were locals to the Cedar Rapids area, and one man was in his 50s at the time of the murder, and the other was in his 30s. 
Detective Matt Denlinger told the Gazette, there was a lack of witnesses. Not many people were out and about on Mount Vernon Road at three in the morning at the time. There was no real physical evidence that pointed to a perpetrator and there was no video. There just wasn't enough to go on. I think if there had been video, it really would have expedited things. I think it really would have helped investigators narrow their search immediately and maybe the case would not have gone cold. With a camera, there's a time and date stamp so you know exactly when something occurred. You could see if there was a vehicle involved and get the make and model. You could likely tell how many suspects were involved and even if you couldn't identify the suspects, you could at least determine some identifying characteristics such as sex, height, and possibly race. Detective Matt Denlinger added, we've done all we can do on this case. He said, we've really put our best effort into reaching a conclusion and helping the family get some answers. And this is as close as we are able to come. I'm quite pleased with the work that we've done and I'm excited that I get to tell his parents while they are still alive that we've come to a conclusion. I hope that it gives them a little peace and I'm quite happy to say that 30 years after the fact, we did not give up and we did not settle on suspects that were frankly not the right guys. Of course, when it comes to Brian's parents, they wish that these two men that are said to be responsible for their son's murder would have paid the price, that justice would have been served. All in all though, they are extremely happy that the case is finally considered solved. As somebody who is simply researching the case and putting the information together for a video for my subscribers, I really don't know how they even narrowed the suspect list down and came to the conclusion that it was these two men responsible. There was no physical evidence left at the scene like say hair or fingerprints or a knife. There was nothing there and they also kept no DNA on file that they had found because this was before DNA testing was around. Also another bit of information that I couldn't personally find online is whether the people responsible had known Brian personally or not because like I said before, his father Arnold did think that the person or people responsible had known Brian personally. Due to their age though, somebody who was in their 50s and somebody who was in their 30s, I mean it's not impossible but I would guess that they didn't know him personally, but of course I don't know this information. When I was doing a little bit of personal digging on this case, I came across a post about the case on the Iowa Cold Cases Facebook page, and there was a comment that stuck out to me. I'll keep the person's name private, but it reads, did not live in Cedar Rapids when this happened, but later on when I moved there, one of the former employees became my best friend. She was scheduled to work that night and they had swapped shifts. It could have been her. Such a strange, strange thing as nobody heard anything. I've heard there was a thunderstorm that night and that might be why. So like I said before that I had seen on Weather Underground, there was a thunderstorm in the area that night, but that isn't what stuck out to me about this comment. The thing that really stuck out to me is that her friend was the one that was supposed to be working that night instead of Brian, and then they switched shifts. Possibly the two people that are said to have been responsible had targeted her instead, but I also don't know if she had the combination to the safe or not. Of course, all in all, the one thing that could have helped solve this case earlier would have been if there were security cameras there. But when it comes to making changes in this world to help future cases, there's always one case that kind of gets the ball rolling on that change. For instance, the Amber Hagerman case. It was her case that started the Amber Alert and helped save so many children in the future. Then there's the case of Robin Ann Graham. I had covered her case about two years back on my channel and it was her case that helped change the CHP policy to better ensure the safety of stranded female motorists. When it comes to surveillance cameras though, especially in the Cedar Rapids area and all of Iowa, it was Brian's case that helped make that change. So that is basically all of the information that I have about Brian's case. I am very happy that it was finally considered solved even after three decades. One crazy thing though that I have to mention is that less than a year before Brian's case was finally considered solved, another high profile case in Cedar Rapids, Iowa was finally also considered solved. And that is the case of Michelle Martinko, whose case is going to be the next one 
one that I cover in my crime and composition series. If you don't know what that is, I recently started a series on my channel where I discuss cases and I go over all the case details and exactly what happened while also drawing the victim. So definitely keep a lookout for that. Before I end this video though, I of course have to address what is going on in the world right now. Um, everything is just so crazy and I just basically want to say that I'm sending my love to all of my subscribers and anyone watching this and anyone who has been affected by what is going on currently. Basically, I'm just sending everybody a virtual hug right now. I love you all dearly and I will see you guys in my next video.